。这期影片要讨论一个对于所有的 YouTube 创作者来说都非常重要的话题——版权问题。在 YouTube 这个平台上面，了解版权的政策是非常重要的。你可能会因为一个小小错误，导致你影片失去盈利、被警告，甚至是被封号。所以这期影片为深度的讲解 YouTube 的版权政策，区分不同的版权声明，并且会和你分享如何去避免踩到版权的红线，从而去保护你的频道还有广告收入。还有 Squison， 这频道就是放关于 YouTube 频道运营、流量变现以及网络创业内容。我每周分享三部影片，需要记得订阅频道。若是新手创业者，你可以透过影片下方链接去免费领取 YouTube 新手成功宝典，它会从不同的方面去告诉你如何去正确经营频道。那么什么是版权呢？简单来说，版权就是对某一作品它的法律保护。这个作品它可以是音乐、影片、文字、图片等等。当一个人创作出了这些作品之后，他就自动拥有了这些内容的版权。如果说其他创作者想要去使用这些内容，就必须要去征得版权所有者他同意。版权不仅仅是在一个国家有效的。它是全球都有效的，大多数国家都会有类似的法律保护，但是具体每个国家它的法律会有一些不同，所以作为创作者一定要非常小心，因为即使你的观众是来自于不同国家的，侵犯版权的风险还是存在的。那 YouTube 它是用了一个非常强大的工具，叫 Content ID， 它会侦测在影片里面是否用到了他人版权内容。当你在上传影片的过程中 ，YouTube 就会使用 Content ID 的工具来扫描你的影片内容。如果在扫描过程中，它发现了受版权保护的音乐或者影片的片段，那么就会发出版权声明。那版权声明还有版权警告是两个完全不同的概念。如果说你收到了版权声明，那就代表你的影片里面有受。版权保护的内容，包括音乐或者是影片内容。那版权的所有者，他是有权利去收回你所有的影片收益，或者是让你影片下架的。版权声明对于你频道流量是完全没有影响的，只会影响到你频道所收获到的广告收益。所以，如果说你完全能够接受你的频道没有收益，那么你是可以不去管版权声明的问题的。而版权警告，它是一个更加严重的问题，它表示了你侵犯到了他人的版权。的频道每收到一次的版权警告，你的频道就会收获到不同等级的惩罚。如果说你的频道连续收到了三次的版权警告，那么你的频道就会被关闭。那如果你收到了版权声明或者版权警告，你应该怎么办呢？我找到了一个对于 YouTube 的版权政策有非常深入研究的律师，他做出了非常具体的解释。Just take you through the copyright strike process. Generally, it's initiated from what's called a DMCA takedown notice, and that means In this world of mass media, most of the time, one of these striking companies that works for Sony Pictures, let's say, has found your content through the YouTube database, and it's decided that they want to have you take it down. A copyright strike appears on your account, and then sometimes you have seven days to make some edits to your content to be able to take out that copyrighted content. Sometimes it's an immediate takedown, and the next step is either an appeal to YouTube or what's called a counter notification. And that's generally when I come in. I'm the guy that say, "Listen, Ian, what do I?" Say in this response to the copyright strike, how can I convey that this is properly not copyright infringement? And so, a lot of our discussions talks about whether or not you got permission. Where did you get this clip? What was the context for this clip? That's kind of the process. 我们接下来要讨论一个概念。内容合理使用，你是不是在平时看影片的过程中，你看到了一些创作者，他们在影片里面使用了你感觉会受到版权保护的内容，但好像他们的影片还是可以正常盈利，他们频道还是可以正常运行呢、啊？这让你很不解，为什么他们不会害怕去收获到版权声明或者是版权警告呢？这就是要引入合理使用内容的概念了。它是一个版权法下的法律原则，是能够让你在某些使用的情况下，能够去使用受版权保护的内容，而并不需要版权的使用者他的许可的。合理使用内容通常是对于教育、评论。新闻报道、研究等目的而设计的。然而，这并不是一个固定的法则，而是要通过具体情况来具体判断。You can use someone else's content in your videos without their permission. If you do something that sufficiently transforms that work of art and it makes it your own, and I've said this so many times, and I know it sounds kind of made up and it sounds just unclear, but I want to get to the root of it. And really, the root of it is this: If I were to show a 15-minute clip of Obi Kenobi.
Hello there. If I were to show a 15 minute clip on my YouTube channel, would people be coming to my channel to watch that particular scene for its entertainment value? Or would they be coming there to watch me? And chances are they would not be coming to watch me. They would just want to see the Star Wars show and see what happened. If I put that 15 minute clip on my channel, I wouldn't transform it because people are not really there for me. I have to make my own art that builds upon the Star Wars show. So how do I do that? Well, under Title 17 U.S. Code Section 107, which is a federal law that's basically adopted by YouTube, it says, listen, here are some examples of de facto transformation. In other words, things that you can do, which we just recognize as fair use. And one of those is commentary. And YouTube even takes it a step further and they recognize reaction. But we'll talk about commentary first. We're talking about the law. The law basically says, if you are discussing this and you are making critical opinions about Obi-Wan Kenobi and, you know, you're saying it's bad or you're saying it's good, then we want that. And frankly, a lot of the studios want it too because it boosts up the popularity of the art. 而且, Another one is teaching. You know, a good example is, uh, boy, it's hard to get Drake music in your YouTube video and not get a claim or a copyright strike. But you can if you are a beat creator and you want to teach how unique those bass drums are in uh, Drake's music. But there's certain things you'd have to adhere to. And I want to kind of take you through those too. If you're teaching the content and people are showing up to learn about how to make a Drake song, not to listen to a Drake song, then that's transformation. News reporting is another one. We see it all the time. There's lots of people out there that are reporting on the news. I do a lot of that. I will say that there's a new little thing that's happening in the live stream area. And I'm sure you've seen, I know Emily D. Baker has been on the vidIQ channel. We're seeing mass live streaming, right? It's kind of unexplainable, but we're seeing a lot of lawyers and other people literally just putting CNN or or some channel on their channel and we're watching it together with commentary. Now, commentary is great. However, there's so many gaps between the actual copyrighted content and the commentary that we're going to probably see some problems going forward. Also, we're going to start seeing some corporations are saying, like CNN as an example, hmm, we're getting 500,000 views of our content on our channels and our, our streaming platform just went down. And we're seeing that Legal Bytes is getting 100,000 an hour. They're trying to do their best to use some commentary, which would be on our fair use. You know, critique, of course, is another concept for fair use. And then, of course, there's another category of fair use, which is just, it, it's not identified. It's just that it's sufficient transformation and it's a subjective determination. In other words, a judge or a jury looking at it has to make their own conclusion about whether or not that's fair use. Luho 我可以尽量的去避免它 There's nowhere that this is enshrined in law It is not in the copyright rules of YouTube It's not in the terms of service But I have to tell creators sometimes That a bright line rule is Don't use more than two to five seconds of clips If at all possible If there is an exception Obviously there is fair use with 30 seconds There's been fair use with a minute There has been But if you're really trying to plan out your video And it's all about something you're reviewing Do your best to limit these clips And realize that every time you go over this amount You're adding risk so is the laugh or the teaching moment really worth the risk of one, getting a copyright strike, getting a claim, losing all revenue for that video, or worse, getting a copyright infringement claim? So two to five seconds, that's kind of the sweet spot to be able to avoid copyright claims. YouTube的版权问题对创作者的收入有多大的影响呢? 所以大家非常关心的当你影片里面有包含受版权内容的时候这不仅会影响到你的影片是否能够公开的播放同时也会影响到你这部影片是否能够获得广告收入首先就是收入分成当你在影片里面去加入一些受版权保护内容这里面包
版权收益。那么这个情况下 ，YouTube 会根据这个版权的持有者他所设定的比例来分给你一些广告收入。如果说你影片直接侵犯了版权，而不是去通过 Content ID 来执行分配收入，那么这个时候版权持有者就会发出版权警告。这种警告会比单纯的收入分成来的更加严重，因为它会影响到你整体的频道运营。如果说你收到了第一次的版权警告 ，YouTube 就会发出通知，你必须要去研究学习 YouTube 的版权政策，它的教学影片，同时承诺去遵守 YouTube 的版权政策。如果说你再犯了，收到了第二次的版权警告，那么在这一次的时候，你是不能够去上传新影片，不能够直播，还有其他的创作活动的。这个禁止的周期会持续两周。如果说你的频道连续累积到了三个版权警告，那么 YouTube 就会直接删除掉你的频道，并且。移除掉你所有的影片，在你收到版权警告之后，有可能相关的影片会被要求下架，然后你的影片是没有办法去获得广告收入的。此外，你整个频道它的盈利功能可能会受限制，或者是被禁用，会影响到你频道里面其他影片的收益。所以，这对 YouTube 创作者来说影响是非常大的。为了避免去踩到 YouTube 的版权政策红线，我认为最安全的方式就是去创造出自己原创的内容，这不仅会让你去避免收到版权的纠纷。同时，也能够去保证到你的影片是能够完全获得收益的，并且从长期来看，对于你打造个人品牌也是非常有好处的。如果说你想在影片里面去加入一些音乐、音效或者是影片、图片的素材，你可以用一些专门提供这些素材的平台，他们都是能够让你去无版权的使用的。你可以看这两期影片。里面会有具体的介绍。如果你觉得这期影片对你有帮助，想的这部影片点赞，也大家记得订阅我频道，了解更多关于 YouTube 内容。追踪 IG 能够很多的互动。那我们下期片再见，拜拜。